Good evening, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. And it looks like I'm going to be preaching to the choir, uh, talking to Joan here while everybody was filing in. Uh, it looks like everybody um, is fairly tuned in to uh, native plants and the importance of native plants. So um, I'm excited to talk to you about what we do at Cabrillo National Monuments and the techniques that we use. They may be different from um, things that you've heard before, or they may be similar. Um, so, you know, hopefully you'll learn a few things uh, and you'll have some takeaway. Um, but we all know that um, native plants are really important for um, biodiversity out there. Um, I was going to introduce myself, but um, Joni did such a good job at it that uh, I'm going to skip this and go directly into this. Um, so why native plants? Um, they are very important. We know that there's a lot of talk about it um, and what they do in our, in our backyards, in our gardens um, is create habitat connectivity. And this is to um, mitigate or combat the biodiversity loss. Um, we've all heard about climate change. Um, it's been on the forefront of environmental movements for a long time. Um, but uh, biodiversity crisis and bio biodiversity loss is something that is um, a little newer on the scene of environmental, environmental cons concerns. Um, but there are international gatherings uh, that are trying to address these issues because we're losing species faster than we uh, realize. And a lot of it is due to habitat fragmentation and habitat loss. And especially here in Southern California, uh, a lot of, you know, we have a perfect weather. A lot of people want to settle down here at least the ones who can still afford it. <laughs> um, and um, we need to start thinking about creating um, connectivity in our neighborhoods for some of the species that we've displaced to be able to survive. Um, it's affecting um, a lot of invertebrates. Um, it's affecting plant pollination. It's affecting uh, birds and everything on the food chain from there on. And it has a great uh, impact on the economy um, and on, um, uh, on the environment, of course. So uh, when we start about putting a, a native plant garden, a lot of people um, don't know where to start. Um, it can, you know, they hear that native plants are expensive. Um, fortunately, there's a little more, uh, 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 more nurseries now that are uh, producing and selling native plants. Um, so the prices are going down a little bit, but there's a lot of habitat restorations that are going on right now. And if you're going to a nursery to get a, the plant, specific plant that you want, a lot of the time they won't have it available uh, because they're selling everything uh, um, to um, um, habitat restoration efforts um, somewhere else. So it can be a little frustrating. Um, and sometimes there's lack of information. You're not sure where to go or what plant to put in. So the best way to start um, with native plants is um, just like um, um, a recovery program, just one plant at a time. Just don't rush it. You don't have to bulldoze your whole yard and, and switch over to um, uh, completely native plants. You can actually take it fairly slowly and, and put one plant at a time and, you know, just work, work your way through. If there's a a, a non-native plants that you have in your yard and you really are attached to it, there's no reason to get rid of it. Um, you know, there's probably room for um, a native plant somewhere else. Um, and one way to cut on the cost too is actually to do your own plant propagation. So I'm gonna talk to you briefly about the basics of native plant propagation tonight. Um, it's gonna be starting with um, seed collection, seed cleaning, and seed storage, which some of you will be familiar with since I heard that you have a wonderful seed library. Um, and we're going to talk about sowing uh, seeds and cuttings. Um, interestingly enough, a lot of people, uh, when they're interested in um, native plant propagation, they instantly go to cuttings because they are intimidated with doing propagation from seeds. Um, 
I personally think, well, first of all, it's better for the plants to do it from seed because of genetic diversity and you're not creating clones everywhere. Um, but it's also, I think, easier. It takes a little more patience, but it's actually easier to do it from seeds. So don't get intimidated with starting your plants from seeds. Um, it's a great way to do it. We're going to talk about transplanting uh, plants and planting in the environment and the water watering requirements. Um, I get a lot of questions about that too. So the rules of seed collections are fairly simple. Um, you do not want to collect on public lands without a permit. Uh, whether it is city, county, state, or federal land, you need a permit um, uh, usually to do it. Um, sometimes it's as simple as a um, verbal agreement, um, but a lot of these places will actually require that you file paperwork somewhere and, and say why you're collecting the seeds and it will have a, uh, to be, it will need to be a purpose. So if you're working, let's say for a specific garden and then you need a certain seed stock, um, approach these places and ask them about their, per their permit requirement. Um, and they may be able to grant you a permit to do some um, seed collection there. So don't get too intimidated by that, but make sure you go through that process. You do not want to start um, going into um, a place and start collecting seeds without authorization. That is not a good thing to do. Um, a good thing to do is to collect on private property with owner's permission. So if you're in your neighborhood, you have people that have um, um, native plants. And I hear, I just heard about this wonderful garden tour that was uh, um, offered in April. That's actually a good way to start getting to know those neighbors and to um, go to them and say, hey, I noticed that you have this blue elderberry there and I was interested in doing some propagation from that. Can I come and pick some berries when they are ripe? And um, chances are these people are gonna be just fine with you doing that. Um, so you can get to know your neighbors that have native plants. That's probably the easiest way for you to start your, prop your own propagation. Um, there's a rule to try to not take um, more than 10% of available seeds on one plant. That rule really applies to, um, to an area uh, that needs repopulation or um, uh, an area like a, a, a city, park, county, state, or federal land. Usually they wouldn't want, they would want you to follow that rule so that you're not depleting um, resources for the animals um, or that you're not preventing that plant from propagating itself in the environment. Um, so that's, you know, if you're, if you're collecting on private property, you usually can go, you know, and collect as much as, as you want. Um, you need to know what you're collecting and um, when to collect. The what is very, very important. I can't stress that enough because um, I have done it where I have thought, seen something, you know, that was going to seed and thought, oh, I think that's this plant. I'm going to collect that and I'm going to propagate it. And um, you end up propagating a, an invasive species. <laughs> and that's, that's no fun because you go through all that effort of propagation and you end up with something you really don't want, something you've been trying to get rid of. You just throw it in the trash and that's fine. Um, but it's a little frustrating to go through all that work. So it's, you know, um, um, Joan was talking about um, iNaturalist earlier. I cannot praise iNaturalist enough. I'm uh, completely obsessed with it um, and use it all the time. Uh, take pictures, post it on iNaturalist. Um, it has a very good AI where it's going to be able to identify your plant usually to the right species. And if not, um, there's plenty of uh, botanists and parabotanists on iNaturalist that love looking at these observations and they will actually um, be able to correct your ID and tell you, and that will tell you whether it's native or not. Um, you can also email people that know about plants uh, or botanists um, or check other online resources. You can do a photo search or something like that. But honestly, iNaturalist is probably the best route to go in order to make sure that you're identifying the plant and you're collecting the right thing. Sometimes it will involve actually going into um, a space and flagging 
that plant because that plant may look very different once it goes to seed. Um, if you're talking about something that's um, a small um, annual plant, the 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 stem will have dried out, maybe the leaves will have fallen out, and the seed pods will make that you know will shape the 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 plant differently. So it's going to be hard to recognize um, uh, once it goes to seed. So um, you know sometimes you want to flag them in advance. Um, you also know when to um, collect the seeds. There's such a thing as too early. Um, if you uh, this is a seed dahlia, and um, if you you know collecting the seeds from there, um, you can tell that the seeds are coming off very easily. So this is ready to collect. If I had to pluck and force plug the seeds out of there, that's not quite ready. Uh, the seeds may not be mature enough. The seeds are those black uh, pods right there, long, uh, long pods. Everything else here is just shaft, what we call shaft, that's uh, flower material, um, petals and things like that. So these are not going to do anything, but you you know this is what you're after, those, those black seeds right there. And then there's this, such a thing as too late too. You may find seeds, for example, black sage is a good example where you will have an inflorescence um, and you actually want to pick the inflorescence when it's just starting to brown. If you wait until the whole thing is brown, um, at least in my experience, chances are that a lot of seed bugs have already gotten in there and have already started to eat the seeds because the seeds were mature when some of these um, um, inflorescence uh, clusters were actually still a little green. Um, so if you wait too long, you're, it, you know, there's a chance that bugs will have gotten to it and very few of those seeds are going to be viable. So there's a, you know, a, a, um, ways to figure out when, you know, from experience, when to collect uh, what seed. Uh, seed cleaning. Seed cleaning, of course, refers to not cleaning the seeds, you know, in soap and making them shiny. Um, seed cleaning is going to be separating the seed from the shaft. Now, from uh, or the fruit, um, in some cases, like, for example, the seed dahlia, you could plant this uh, shaft and the seeds together in a flat and it will still grow nicely. Um, but for other um, seeds or fruit, you need to actually extract the seed in order for it to grow better. Um, here we have um, salvia mellifera, that's black sage. Um, it works way better if you plug them out of those inflorescence. Um, uh, it's fairly easy to do. Um, the, these are toyon. The toyon is a little more messy to clean out, but extracting those seeds are important. And this is, I believe, ceanothus. Same thing, you know, you, these um, clusters have to pop and the seeds to fall off for uh, you to be able to plant them. If you just plant the fruit, um, it will take forever to germinate and probably uh, rot before it actually can germinate. So you want to extract those seeds and clean them uh, from the rest of the fruit. Now, <laughs> I am interested to talk to you about maybe at, at the end of this lecture about cedar waxwings and what's happening with cedar waxwings these days, because I have not seen a single one in my yard this year. And I have lots of toyons and the toyon palms are just um, um, uh, perishing on my trees and they're, they remain uneaten, uneaten this year and I'm very saddened about that. Um, but sometimes propagation of a, of a plant occurs better when it goes through the digest, digestive tract of a bird. So what I've done with cedar waxwings uh, is uh, when they've come to my backyard, they just gobble up those palms like crazy. They can clean up a tree in a day or two and then they sit on another tree above my driveway and they poop it out everywhere. I was pretty mad when I saw that the first time. <laughs> but then I looked at it closely and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. There's a digested flesh of the toyon right there. But look at these guys right there. These are actually seeds. So I'm French and I have absolutely no shame. So I took a pair of tweezers. And I actually collected all these babies and they were clean for me. <laughs> and guess what? I have had the best results ever from actually propagating from 
seeds that had gone through the digestive tract of a cedar waxwing. Um, I had absolutely amazing results with that. Uh, toyons are fairly easy to to propagate, but I've never had um, such amazing results as when I collected directly from um, uh, cedar waxwings poop. So it's always something you can do. <laughs> easy seed cleaning right there. Nature nature does it for you. Um, in terms of storage, you want to collect your seeds in a paper bag or paper envelope. Uh, do not use uh, uh, Ziploc bag or a jar or something that's sealed. Um, if there's any moisture in your in your seed or your shaft, um, that will create uh, fungus and that mo that's most likely going to compromise your seed batch. Um, so putting them in envelopes will actually um, 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 help it, you know, dry naturally uh, in the envelope. If it's wet when you're collecting it, well, you want to avoid collecting when the seed is wet on a rainy day or on a, on a morning when there's a lot of morning dew. You'd rather do that a little later when it's dry. Um, so, it, but if for whatever reason you have a batch that's a little wet, you want to let it dry a little bit before you even put it into an envelope. Um, and I, we put our seed almost systematically in the freezer, actually systematically in a freezer for two to three days. Um, sometimes, you know, up to a week. Um, if we see a lot of signs of bugs in what we've collected, we actually, I'm going to leave them in the freezer for up to a month to make sure that all these bugs are um, goners um, by the time I um, put my envelope in the seed cabinet. Uh, I do not want to store, you know, if you if you have any live bugs in there, they will just continue eating the seeds uh, while it's in the envelope. Uh, and so when you're ready to sow the seeds, um, you will not get many results because a lot of your seed will be compromised. So that's um, a good way to uh, deal with those bugs right there, a natural, uh, non-toxic way to deal with the bugs. Label your... Um, envelopes uh, are your storage bags um, and date them. That will give you a record of what you collected and when. Um, that way you uh, know what year, what time of year. So the following year, if you want to collect again, it's like, oh, that's right. That's when I did that. You have that information right there. And then sometimes you may think, oh, I, I know that it's that species by looking at, at the envelope. Uh, are looking at the seed and then you know if you for example collect uh, California buckwheat and then you decide to collect some chemise and you didn't label your envelopes it's going to be very difficult for you to tell which one is which um, in the end um, so um, and then you can store those envelopes into a cabinet a drawer you know as long as it's a dry um, and dark place you know they're fine just keep them away from the heat and away from humidity Sewing. Um, I want to talk di about direct sew, which is not a bad idea, but there's there's definitely some downfall to that. Uh, the best way to do that is before rain events uh, in the fall. Um, you don't want to do it too late. Like, you know, I know it's going to be raining, for example, on Saturday, but um, it might be not as much rain as... Uh, we might think, uh, and then if there's no rain event beyond beyond that, those plants may not grow uh, to maturity um, before the heat starts to um, go up. So really when the temperatures are cold and then when there's um, rain events, uh, one after the other is the best uh, time to do so. Make sure you disturb the soil and um, to create natural grooves in your soil so that the seeds can fall in the cracks and have good uh, contact with the soil. And then of course, water. But you may run into a couple of things. You may run into birds. We love birds, right? <laughs> but they love seeds. Um, and it's very easy for them to grab the seeds out of the soil um, uh, if, if, if it's simply sown like this. Um, and then they also love um, little uh, seedlings that come up. They're usually very yummy. So you may not see a whole lot of results doing that. Um, at, at, it, in worst case scenario, nothing grows, but some seeds will stay in the ground and maybe later something is going to come up or at least it will change your, your soil composition to something a little better and then fight off invasives. So that's, the, 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 that's, that's, oh, that's never a too bad idea, but 
it's not the best uh, efficient or the, the most efficient way to um, um, to sow plants. There's exceptions to that. There's there's plants that are not very easy, at, at least in my experience, to grow in containers. Um, um, local weed and um, deer weed come to mind where it's actually a lot easier to just spread seeds out. And those are usually very fruitful. Um, so there's plants that, that work great for direct sow. Um, you can use a flat and you don't have to do anything fancy. This is actually a, a dinner plate from a takeout restaurant. I just poked some holes at the bottom with a drill and voila, this is a flat. Um, and I <laughs> grew some deadlias in there. You can, and then you just spread a lot of seeds in, the, in, in that flat and then you'll get a lot of plants that you'll need to transplant individually later. Um, or you can, uh, for plants that don't like to have too much root disturbance, you can also do individual um, uh, containers. Uh, and then you would put two to four seeds in each container. When they grow to a certain size, you want to thin out the weaker plants and then keep one, the best plants in there. Um, so that's that's a good way to do it too. Um, and then you can put those directly into the ground Um, um They'll need a lot of support because it's not a very big pot, but sometimes that's the best way to deal with those plants that don't like um, root disturbance too much. Uh, medium, the soil that we use, and again, it's, you know, you may have different experiences. That's the way we do it at, at our greenhouse. Um, we do a, a peat moss and perlite mix. Uh, it's heavy on the peat moss. We do 80%. Uh, and to about 20% ratio. And um, um, our plants, our native plants do good in denser soils um, compared to, let's say, a vegetable gardenings or, um, or regular um, ornamental gardening. Um, usually those plants are grown into 50% peat moss, 50% perlite. That's, you know, if you buy a premix bag at uh, the store that's what you're going to get about 50 50 of peat moss to perlite we like we like to go uh, heavier uh, for native plants heavier on the peat moss um, very very important pre-moisten your soil before you plant um, uh, your seeds they you need to have moisture throughout the flat or the container that you're going to be putting your seeds in um, and that the only way to do that consistently is to pre-moisten your soil. Um, we do what we call the clump test. That means we will water the soil and mix it up together uh, to make sure it's nicely, nicely evenly watered. Um, when you clump it, you don't want water to run off. So it, you don't want it to be soggy. Um, and when you open your hand, you want that clump to stay together. If it starts falling apart, that means it's just a little too dry yet and you need a little more moisture. So that's the clump test. That's going to come back because we, we do that all the time for all our medium. We pre-moisten medium and do the clump test. How deep to, to put the seeds um, in the ground? Um, we usually, that's a, the good rule of thumb is usually to do as, as, uh, deep as the seed is wide. So if you have a five millimeter seed, um, you want to sink it down about five millimeter from the very top of your soil and have about five millimeters of topsoil on top of it. Um, seeds that are very small, uh, like, um, um, what am I thinking? Uh, Dudley is, um, or, uh, Diplicus, the monkey flower. These seeds are so tiny, tiny. Usually you just sprinkle them and you don't even need to cover them. They will, they will start sprouting uh, just like that. You can put a thin layer of sand, a uh, very thin layer of sand on that as well. Um, they, they will be able to navigate um, uh, through that, uh, but you really don't want to cover it, that with any type of layer of soil. Uh, make sure you label and you date your your flats or your containers i uh, can't tell you the amount of time not at work because i do that systematically at work but at home sometimes i'm lazy and i don't do it and then you don't know it's like oh when was it that i planted this flat should i toss it or should i still wait another couple of weeks before it sprouts and i can't even remember what's in there 
in my mind, when I do it, I always think, oh, I'll, I'll remember, you know, there's only three little containers I planted, right? You know, I remember what it is. And honestly, um, I give myself way too much credit because I don't. <laughs> uh, so just label it and makes things a lot easier down the line. Uh, keep your soil moist. Yes, native plants do well in, in, in our dryness, but a seed, no matter what seed, uh, needs moisture in order to germinate. If it dries out during the germination process, it will kaput, it will die. Um, so just keep that soil moist. You, again, you don't want things to be soggy. You don't want things to be drippy um, because then that's not gonna, that's gonna be just too much, but you, they, you need to have some moisture um, uh, on these seeds at all times and on, on your seedlings too, up to a point. When they start growing a little bigger, you, need, you can reduce that water and let that top layer of soil as the, the, as the roots uh, grow down into your soil, then you can let you know a little bit of, it, of the surface dry out as long as the roots are still has moisture. But when they're just sprouting um, and, and when they're very small, they need that moisture in there. So just make sure that you keep um, um, that uh, moist. Keep, uh, the best way to do that is to keep things out of sunlight uh, until the plant uh, root is strong enough to reach the bottom um, layer that still has moisture, basically. And then protect from critters. Um, I have a greenhouse, but honestly, I don't use it. I have, uh, I now use a shelf uh, that I have outside and I have some kind of caging around it uh, that I made from um, fencing, plastic fencing. So lights can go through, um, but the, uh, the birds and, and rodents don't uh, bother my plants that way. Um, so they can they can grow and they don't get um, picked at by um, and, and the reason I don't use my greenhouse is um, because it just gets too hot in there. Uh, I find that things just grow fine outside um, in temperate weather. That's you know our, our seeds are adapted to do that. Um, we have a greenhouse at, at uh, Cabrillo National Monument and we use it. Um, but uh, Santa Monica Mountains, for example, their nursery, they don't have a greenhouse there. They just do all their propagation outside. They just have a, a enclosed area for all their, their seed starting and seedlings so that they're protected from animals. Um, cuttings, again, I'm gonna talk about cuttings because it is a, a popular demand, but again, don't get intimidated from doing things from seeds. Um, uh, it's preferable for the environment and it's um, it, it's not that hard really. Uh, but for cuttings, you wanna take second year branches usually are the best. Um, honestly, at, at the park, when we do trimming is when I just, you know, I use the branches and instead of throwing them away, we use the branches to, to do some cuttings. We only do cuttings with two species, which is um, the, um, I have the Latin names coming up in my head. So um, the uh, um, cliff spurge and the uh, bushmallow, chaparral bushmallow. Um, everything else we do from seed. Um, and um, so the second year branches are going to be ideal. You want to cut through the, you know, next to a branch, never in the middle of the branch. So you just find a connection and then cut that whole section right there. Uh, this will be the second year right here, and then here will be the first year um, growth. The first year growth, you can still use it, but those branches usually are, are more flimsy. Uh, so they're harder to poke into the, into the medium. Um, and then when it's best, you know, after it flowers, when the plant uh, is triggered to, to uh, grow um, leaves or grow branches or uh, focus on reproduction, it sends its energy outwards and not to, you know, to creating roots or reinforcing roots. But after it's done with the reproduction process, uh, it can, um, um, it, it's going to be better for them, for, for, the, for the energy of that plant to focus on uh, developing roots. Um, this is kind of the way we do, we, we do our um, 
cuttings, sometimes I see gigantic shoots in, in people's flat when they do cuttings. You don't need anything more than just four inches. Your, your medium is going to be about a couple of inches, and then you're going to have about a couple of inches sticking out on the, on the top. Um, the bottom of it is going to be cut at a slant. It's just to give it a little more surface for roots to come in. Um, and you will want about four inches. Uh, the palm of my hand is about four inches. So that's how I, that's what I use to measure. And that's how I tell people to do it. Just measure with the palm of your hand, put the bottom of the, of the, of your shoot, um, at your pinky and then cut right above your thumb right there. You want to try to cut right under a node if you can. Uh, because that top part right there can be used for another cutting, for a second cutting. Um, so that'll be the bottom of your second cutting up there. Up there. Um, you need to clip the uh, leaves that are at the bottom right there. And those nodes here is are also places where the plant might create some roots or might send some roots from. So the roots are going to come from the bottom, but also from the sides there. Um, if you are using um, hormone, you want to put uh, hormone powder or solution um, on the bottom and on the nose right there. And then the big difference also with cuttings um, from that you would do in a regular nursery uh, for ornamental plants or for vegetables is that usually in uh, those nursery you will have, um, they you also use mainly perlite or sometimes even 100% perlite uh, for the medium but they usually have one cutting in a pot and that's that. Or if they do a, a, a flat like this, they actually uh, will have the, the cuttings very much spaced out. With natives, and that's a technique that I use, that I learned from um, the person at um, um, Santa Monica Mountains. Um, this is the way he's always done it and it works well is to actually cluster them together. And the reason for that is that it's gonna retain moisture longer. And that means you're not gonna to have to water them as often. You Again, you wanna keep them moist, not soggy. Um, and then you wanna avoid um, overhead watering too much. So clustering them together is gonna to help that um, uh, these plants to actually keep the moisture intact and then um, they will develop the roots underneath. Um, you can also use um, heating pads if you want underneath. I've heard that uh, we don't don't have the, the capacity to do that at the greenhouse because we don't have power. Um, but that's a technique that has been used, um, that is used commonly actually in nurseries is to put a heating pad underneath uh, on low. And um, sometimes you have to actually put a layer if it gets too hot uh, in between the heating pad and, and the flat. Um, but that can actually, Actually stimulate uh, that heat can actually stimulate um, your, your the growth. However, it needs to be out of direct sunlight. That sunlight um, directly on that flat is going to dry things too quickly, and it's not going to be good for your plants. Um, um, when the roots are visible at the bottom, you know, lift up your flat, and when you start seeing root at the bottom, that's time for um, transplanting those those babies. And then they probably, we just talked about that briefly before the lecture, uh, the, the easiest way to propagate native plants is to just plug them out of the ground when they just propagate on their own in somebody's yard. I have done that uh, at a friend's house where she had some um, sick leaf buckwheat and I wanted to put some in my yard. And she's like, oh, I have like a hundred little seedlings that are just, you know, everywhere. And I don't want sick leaf buckwheats everywhere. So I just went over there with my little shovel and I just shoveled them up and um, put them in pots to encourage them to grow bigger before I actually planted them in my yard uh, and gave some away. But um, uh, these are holly leaf cherries. So the, the squirrels will eat my, the, the cherries, and the squirrel and rats and um, Orioles actually love the cherries too. Uh, and then the cherries are going to fall and th those spits just start growing um, and I get I get so many little trees, baby trees at the bottom. I just take my trowel and I just plug them out of the ground. Uh, you want to get as much of the root as possible and um, plop, plop them in your medium, pack it up and that's it. You have a, a good plant to go. Uh, it's not a hundred percent success, but it's actually very 
um, very close to them. Um, you know, I lose out of, you know, maybe 20 plants I'll, I'll, ha I'll do like this. I maybe will lose a couple, but that's it. And I, I do that with everything, with Toyon, with um, things like uh, Sea Dahlia that works well, uh, Buckwheat, um, uh, Coastal Sagebrush, yeah, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can pluck out the babies out of the ground and, and they work just fine. Transplanting um, is an important process. Um, you don't want to plant a plant that's too small in a yard. So if you have a little baby, you want to put it into a little bigger space. Um, it will give some room for the roots to grow. And uh, it will also save you on water. And it's actually going to be good, better for the plant too. So, you know, um, if, if it's not watered as often. Um, just to get it acclimated to having a, a little less water, but there's going to be more moisture staying in a big in a bigger pot at the bottom of that pot for the roots, rather than a, a very small spot like a uh, pot like this will dry out a lot quicker. So this you have to water every day. This you know maybe every other day, or you know um, you can space it out a little more. Um, you don't want to choose a container that's too big and move a plant, you know, to a too big container. Um, if your plant is living in a, um, a one bedroom studio apartment, do not move it into a mansion, a five gallon pot. Uh, you want to move it through a condo or a house first, you know, upgrade it gently and then move it to a bigger pot if you need to later on. Um, the, the, Plant, the pot does not need necessarily to be wider. Um, it's better that it's longer, so you have a longer root. And then we'll see why later on. Um, the medium, any putting soil, really, uh, this is the one we use at the greenhouse. We actually use also some uh, native um, uh, soil that we have uh, on hand, or it's kind of a sandy soil that we mix with it. Um, so if you have some of that available, you can do that. But, you know, just any putting soil will work fine. Um, if if you find it too dense, you can add a little perlite to that. But um, um, otherwise, if it's a nice soft uh, soil, it'll work just fine. Uh, again, moisture your medium. Make sure you do that clump test. Um, to transfer the plant, I'm not sure that this is the best illustration for it. Um, I'm going to... And in the future, I'm going to do like maybe a video of how to how to do this. It'll probably be easier. But basically, um, you want to take care to not break your plant when you're taking it out of the pot. Um, I find that uh, putting the plant in between your fingers like this works well. Um, that gives the support to the soil so the dirt doesn't shoot out of the of the pot. Um, and uh, you can massage the sides of the pot and tap on the bottom and your plant should be coming right out. Um, you want to put some medium into your new pot uh, and leave space for your new plant. And when you put your new plant in, you want the base of your new plant to be just uh, almost at the border level, just below the, the border level, maybe a quarter inch below. Um, and then you're not going to add soil next to the plant. You're actually going to add soil around the plant and pack, pack, pack that soil. If I take my finger and I push on that soil right here, it should not go anywhere. I should not be able to to um, put my finger through the soil. It, it, our, our plants are very well adapted for compact soil, but you don't want to compact the soil directly on the roots, on top of the roots here. You want to compact the soil coming from the side. So that's where you're going to fill out, fill out your pot and, and, um, and, and move it inward and down. And then water thoroughly, always, always. You cannot overwater on transplant day or on planting day. Planting. Um, you do not need to dig the Grand Canyon in order to put a one gallon plant in the soil. Just plant uh, the regular size, uh, the size of your pot, maybe slightly larger. Uh, do not dig something that's slightly smaller than your plant that you don't want to to do and then we'll see why in a little bit um, but just slightly larger is just fine or just the same size um free water your holes especially if you're if your soil once you dig you will see if your soil is dry if it's dry make sure you pre-water your holes you may need to do it more than once 
to make sure that this, the, the, the soil around the hole is going to be nice and moist that will give the best chance for those growing roots to be able to penetrate that soil and have that humidity to support it. Uh, again, in order to grow uh, roots, that plant needs some moisture. Uh, so that's that's what happens when it starts. It needs moisture. Um, um, remove the plant from the container, of course, and then put it in the ground. Um, the base of the plant should be at the same level, if not sunk in uh, slightly, very slightly down from the soil level. Um, um, in this case, you know, you would fill out the sides first and again, compact as much as possible. And then you can put a thin layer of soil on the top there um, to support your plants. Um, if you have a lot of dirt left over, uh, like a pile of dirt, you can just throw it on the side. It doesn't have to be mounds or anything like that, but just the unevenness of that soil when you're watering will prevent a little bit of the run uh, uh, for, for uh, of, um, the water running off. So that's that's one thing you can do. Just sprinkle the the extra dirt that you have around uh, the perimeter of the plant. Um, what you don't want to do, and that's what I was um, mentioning when I said do not dig a hole that's actually too small. You do not want to have the top of your plant um, sticking up like this. And the reason is, you know, like sometimes that happens and you're pushing the plant down and it's like, oh, shoot, I, I put that plant a little, you know, I, I didn't dig quite far enough, but that's okay. I'm just going to backfill, you know, going up like that. I call that TP uh, planting. Um, and the problem with that is that that backfill layer that you just put on there is going to erode very easily when you start watering your plant. That's going to be the first thing to be gone and it's going to be gone very easily. Um, and then next, before you plant, the, the plant is going to sink down a little bit, but before it does, that top layer of your plant here is going to erode and your roots are going to be showing. And that's that's no bueno for that plant. It's not going to like it. It's probably going to be stressed and, and and going to die. And you can try to do that backfill again and, and, and then um, put more dirt, you know, to protect those roots you're going to have more erosion and that plant is going to struggle forever and ever. Um, it's just as good as being gone. So do not do that. If you, if that happens, find a way to pull that plant out of the ground, dig a deeper hole and then put it back in there. Uh, slope planting can be sometimes difficult, um, but um, you want to try to level the, the top of your plant slightly at the same level as, as your, your downslope. If I drew a line right there, that would be about at the same level or just slightly lower. Um, so same principle as what we know with flat soil. Uh, this is going to be obviously buried a little more because your plant is going to be straight, but you have a slope. So there's going to be more backfill there, but that's fine. Um, and then you want to create... Um, these are exaggerated. It doesn't have to be that deep, but create some uh, slight indentation behind your plant on the upslope and um, create a little mound on the front of your plant on the downslope so that it catches the water. So when you're watering above, you don't have to water right at the base of the plant. Actually, you can water up there on the top of the slope. The water is going to fall here and here. And when it starts running up down below, you want to stop watering, wait until all that water is absorbed, and then do it again. Water some more, and then again, when it starts running up, wait until it, it gets absorbed, etc. cetera. Um, a good way to keep moisture on a plant is to introduce either mulch around the plant um, uh, on the soil or use rock or a log um, on the south end of the plant. And why the south end is because, you know, you have your sun usually shining right over there. Um, on the north end of your plant, there's going to be natural shading occurring on, on that section right there. So the moisture is going to be remaining there. But that south end right there is going to get nailed by that sun and, and water is going to evaporate from there quite quickly. So in order for that to, for the, for, for that plant to not stress out too much and be more moist, uh, put a, a rock, a log or something on the south end there 
or you can put mulch all around the plant if you want to. But I find that the the the, the rock or the log works really well. Um, I just went last Sunday to um, Enza Borrego and I saw so many plants that were, you know, there were rocks and the plants would be, you could tell that the, the seed was probably right underneath the rock and the plant just snuck out on the, on the north side of the rock and survived right there. And there would be nothing around, nothing growing around that rock except for that one little plant on the north side of that rock. So it's just a, a good strategy for um, uh, moisture, you know, a little bit, that little bit of extra moisture that a plant can get from the protection from a rock is actually quite, um, quite a big accomplishment. Um, so it's always something good to do or to keep in mind. Watering. Um, watering is possibly one of the most important things. Um, when I say you can't overwater on planting day, you can put two to five gallons per plant, uh, or you, sh you should put two to five gallons uh, per plant on a plant uh, when on planting day. So let's say you're planting a toyon, it would be more so towards the five gallon. If you're planting an agave or a uh, cliff spurge, it's going to be more on the two gallon side, you know, like the more resistant to, to heat and arid soil your plant is, the less water you need. Um, but it's still a lot because you want to water a little bit and then you want to wait until, you know, you don't want to put one gallon all at once and then have all the, ru the water run off. You need to water a little bit, wait until it's absorbed and then water some more, wait until it's absorbed. So it actually can take quite a quite a bit of time to actually put two gallons or five gallons of water on a plant um, if you want to do it right. And then after that, um, there's a, a, a lot of misconception of thinking, oh, well, they, these are native plants. They don't need that much water or, oh, my plant died. I don't understand. I was told to to water um, once a month after planting, uh, but that, that didn't work out, it died. Well, you know, did, did I water too much? Did I water not enough? So this is an example of three plants that, let's say that you plant those three plants in your yard and um, they're different sizes and the roots are going all the way down right there. Now in a two week period, the evaporation rate on the top soil is gonna be about the same for all three plants. That plant that's bigger right there, most of the root is nice and comfy in that soil right there. So this plant's going to be doing fine after two weeks. However, this plant, ah, you're approaching the 50-50 zone, 50%, 50% zone there where um, uh, you, your plant, you know, if, it's, if, if that moisture level goes down a little more, um, eh, the plant may not, to, may not be so happy. And this plant may be really struggling because most of the root that's up here is already dry and there's very low moisture left at the bottom here. So really the size of your plant really dictates how often you should water it. Um, do scratch test on your soils, you know, to see how far the moisture is down, goes down around the plant um, for a while if you're not sure. Um, um, you can also cut, uh, if you have a plant that's not that big, you can also cut the plant, um, the top of the plant up. If it's a plant, there's a, there's a few plants that are not, you know, it's not a good idea to prune, but most of the plants you can just do that. You can just chop their heads off and that's kind of signaling the, to the plant, you know, um, don't spend any, you know, um, energies, you know, sending energy to your leaves up there because I want you to work on your roots right there. So, I mean, it's, it doesn't work that, that way. We don't talk plants, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, the, the plant will not be spending so much energy trying to, um, to, to nourish those leaves and it will go um, uh, or grow those leaves and it will focus uh, mainly underground. It's kind of the same principle when you're planting a fruit tree and you want to take out the buds on the first year so that, it comes on, so that you don't have fruits. So the plant actually focuses on growing as opposed to putting, you know, energy into growing fruit on the first year. You get a, a much better yield of fruit the second year. Same principle. Um, the bigger the plant, the more time you can have between watering, basically. Um, you can gradually decrease as time goes by, uh, but watch out for those heat waves. You know, keep an eye on your plants. If you see them struggling, water them. Um, and then after the first year, 
of planting. Um, if you're planting in the fall, they've had a rainy season and they made it through the summer just fine. And then it's another rainy season. You're out of the woods. You, you're fine. You can just stop watering at this point. They should be established. Uh, basic principles of, am I doing on time? Oh, okay. Basic principles of um, uh, choosing native plants. Uh, look at what's around your, your area. Uh, go to your parks preserve, look at iNaturalist and what people have found around your, your neighborhood. Um, you want to take practicality into consideration, the plant habits. Um, if you have a very small yard, planting a big lemonade berry might not be the, such a great idea. Um, and also upkeep and water needs. Um, sometimes if you have a non-native plant that you like, but it needs a lot of water, and if you plant something like, for example, a mission, a mission manzanita nearby that doesn't like to be overwatered, that's going to be in conflict. So you want to, you want to take that into consideration. Um, upkeep, you know, if you're, if you're putting a plant that needs a, that think is going to need a lot of pruning that you don't want to overtake everything, uh, but it's up on the slope and you have to go climb to go cut it. Uh, you might want to take that into consideration and plant something smaller on that, on that slope. Uh, but if it's, uh, in an area where you're going to have complete access and it's going to be easy for you to trim, then that's fine. And then diversity. You want to diversify um, your plants. You want to do all kinds of shapes and, and shapes and sizes um, and then all kind of uh, shapes of flowers and then colors uh, to attract the maximum amount of um, diversity for of pollinators and the more pollinators and and um, um, different insects that you're going to attract, the greater diversity of birds you're going to attract, and, set, and so on and so on. It's just going to boost up your biodiversity, basically, to have, to have that plant diversity in, um, in a yard. Um, and then you want to also pay attention to seasonality. Try to have a plant uh, that um, blooms in the winter, spring, and summer, and fall. You know, different plants uh, bloom at different times of year. Um, so pay attention to the, the phenology of these plants. Again, I naturally said, I'm going to throw that again at, at you guys. I naturally, is a great way to see when plants are blooming. Um, you can actually go into, uh, the phenology of each plant, um, and know exactly when something is blooming. It's, it's a wonderful tool. Um, a few things to keep in mind for your yard, keep, keep some leaf, leaf litter in place. Uh, animals love to hide in there. They love to reproduce there. There's a lot of uh, pupa and things that hibernate in the uh, leaf litter, and that's going to boost up your biodiversity in your yard. It's a great place for animals to um, hide and nest, and it's also a great place for animals to um, seek. And that's where all your birds come in. They they will that provides foods for them. So don't um you know a, a tidy yard is great, but um leave some litter in place for other things to be able to thrive. It's going to boost up your biodiversity greatly, as 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 well as putting native plants, of course. Um, if you feel like you're going to get overrun by by bugs, and you know your birds are going to take care of that, but and guess what? <laughs> Alligator lizards that love my litter at home, they actually um, are red-shouldered hawks. Take, they take care of uh, population control for these guys. Um, that was not actually previously recorded that uh, red-shouldered hawk um, um, ate alligator lizards, uh, but in our neighborhood, that's their favorite meal. So that's a great show that we get when they when they do that. Um, Bare soil and undisturbed soil is great also to have in your yard. Don't be don't be too keen to put ground cover everywhere and 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 cover everything. We have a lot of um, ground nesting um, critters out there, especially native bees. Um, uh, the majority of native bees actually will nest underground. Um, so if you can leave some undisturbed bare soil for them to do their thing, you'll have more seed production, um, which is food for the birds. It's good for the plants. It's it's great for everybody. Uh, and these guys will pollinate your plants better than anything else out there. Um, let your plants go to seed. Birds love 
eating the seeds. Um, this is San Diego sunflower down here. And this is um, evening primrose up there. Um, they, uh, the finches absolutely love that. And then I have juncos and, and um, but these are goldfinch, but uh, house finches and, and all kind of other birds that actually go at the bottom of the plant for all those seeds that I've dropped and then they just forage on the ground. So it's, it's, I don't need to put a bird feeder in my yard if I let the, the um, plants go to seed. Some of it can be a little unsightly for a little bit, but it's well worth it for, for boosting, again, the biodiversity in your yard and the activity. Uh, this is the evening primrose right there. That's what the finch do. They they spread apart these uh, woody parts right there, and then they get all the seeds that are inside. When I see that my plants are all um, uh, eaten like that, and there's no more seed there, the seed feeder the, the feeder basically is empty, and I just start cleaning up at that time. Um, I don't clean up a hundred percent. Sometimes I cut stems. Um, uh, above ground and I leave some stems going or I will cut a big branch and I will lay it down uh, as horizontal mulching basically uh, because we have critters that actually like to nest into uh, dead branches and twigs. Uh, this is both in both cases this is Stephanomeria and we have a um, small um, uh, uh, ah, uh, carpenter bee right there and they make their nest in there. And these, these are actually communal nests. So you will have several bees actually going into a, a single stem and uh, creating um, different levels of the nest. And then we have um, here, that's a uh, twig ant uh, that's going into a Stephanomeria stem as well. Uh, and that's where the nest, that's um, their little refuge there. So it's, it, it's good to leave some branches and some things, you know, when I'm, so what I'm telling you is that you can be lazy a little bit in your garden and you don't have to clean up everything because um, um, nature doesn't do things that way. And there's a reason for it. Um, um, the animals out there may need uh, that brush. And then seeds sometimes are used in an expected way. Uh, this is um, 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 Alan's hummingbird that's using seeds of meal fat uh, that was at Famosa Slough to um, line its nest. I've seen them at Cabrillo National Monument do that with um, backers as well. So I have some backers in my yard just for, for that purpose. Um, and also it's evergreen, so it's it's a great uh, filler to have in a yard. Um, but, you know, that's another reason to let your your plants go to seed because sometimes there's other use for it. And that's it. <laughs> and um, um, this is just a few resources. Um, this is a great um, um, PDF right there that has that tells you exactly what the seeds look like for every plant. Um, not all the plants are on there, but a lot of Southern California plants are on there. Uh, and of course, the California Native Plant Society has a lot of information. Uh, there's native nurseries, INAT, I can't stress that enough. And then I have my email. You guys are more than welcome to contact me anytime if you need anything, uh, if you have any questions. Um, there's my work email right there if you have any you know, propagation questions. And if you need free plant, if you want free plants, uh, feel free to hit me at my personal address. I, you know, I have... Um, a lot of plants that I grow in my backyard too, and I just give them out. So um, there's that. Um, I have, you know, we can do questions and answers. I have um, two other slides behind that, that kind of, this is more based on a coastal, this is, you know, bias, of course, this is coastal San Diego, um, but this is a good guide of what, what blooms when. So if you want a very, you know, the plants that you have, you can do combinations of these plants, you know, pick from these columns to have um, uh, different times of blooms uh, for these plants. Um, and then this gives you kind of the uh, San Diego native plants by size. So if you want, again, if you want to vary sizes, you can say, oh, I'm going to put, um, I'm going to put some lemonade berry here, but I'm also going to put some, you know, a, a few succulents and a few of these, and then you can pick and choose from that to vary size in your yard. Um, 
So people can take screenshots of that. Um, just let me know if you need to me to go back and forth on that. But that's yeah, that. and, and we are recording this, so mm -hmm. um, so folks can always look at the recording and fast forward it to the end to get this this resource information. Perfect. If you need to. Um, a couple Perfect. of other resources um, I put in the chat is the um, Audubon has plants for birds. They have a site on, on their website. And then also the CalSpace uh, website, which is a really good resource for all the different plants. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we do have a few questions um, that are came in the chat. Um, did you say that you wait to trim or make cuttings from a plant until just after flowering or just after the seed or the fruit production? Uh, just after flowering. Okay. Yeah, usually the 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 maturity of the fruit. I mean, there's a there's again exceptions to that, but the a lot of the fruit can actually mature, you know, outside of being on the plant. Um. So, um. You know the it, you know it, it depends on what it is. Um. But most likely, I would say after flowering, you're pretty safe. Um, if you're dealing with, if you're doing um, a woody plant, like, um, I don't know, Ceanothus or, or uh, Xylococcus, you know, something, something like that, you might want to do it in uh, the, the, when the plant is more dormant, like in the fall. Um, but um, for a shrub, I, you know, you can do it after it flowers and it should be fine. Okay, great. And then um, another question, if these plants have evolved to thrive in our soil, why do we use planting medium instead of native soil in which you plan to put the plant? You could you could use native soil, but um, the problem with that is that you can't really buy native soil anywhere. And unless you start digging in your backyard, you know, something in your backyard to, you know, it usually takes more soil than what you have available in, in your backyard. I mean, there's exception to that. I, I did some work in my backyard and I saved the soil from that and I used it all to do native plant propagation that way. Um, but when you run out, uh, I'm not going to keep digging holes in my yard to, to be able to pot my plants. So that's that's the only issue with that. If you have native soil available, by all means, if it you know if it's a, a good uh, fertile soil, please use it. But it's just, it's it's rarely readily available um, if you're when you're doing um, um, propagation. That's all. Yeah. And a question about California poppies: mm -hmm. Will the green California poppy seed housings yield mature seeds, or do you have to wait for them to dry out? Um, I, my understanding is that you have to wait for it to dry out, which is, um, uh, kind of annoying because it pops open pretty all soon after seeds, it dries out. All it. the seeds yeah, pop so out. <laughs> yes. So there's, there's ways to do that. If you're in a, if you're in a, a, a yard or in a place where, you know, like, um, uh, private property and you have, uh, netting available, uh, like, uh, Maybe not cheesecloth, but um, looking at my, I'm looking at my curtain here. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, you know, some fabric that really, you know, lets the the plant breathe and everything. Um, you can put some of that around the plant, um, and the seeds will pop and fall into, you know, a contained area, and not on the ground. So that's one way to deal with that. I do that with um, blue elderberry because the birds will eat. You know, the, the, you can't pick them before they mature. They won't mature off the tree. That's one of the, those, those examples. Um, but um, if you clip the fruit uh, before they mature, the, 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 the tree or the, the plant will not spend time trying to reach those fruit anymore. So it's a good time to take clippings off anyway, uh, if you do cuttings. But the the um, the point I'm trying to make with the fruit of the the blue elderberries that the birds will get to it right at that time when they ripen and that's when I want them. So I have to actually use a piece of fabric and put it around and, and um, let the the fruit mature and that keeps the birds or anything from from taking it. And I just grab that when it's ready to go. Um, you know, sometimes you just have to to be. Uh, a little sneaky with these things, but some plants are, you know, really hard 
Um, I was just telling this morning uh, to a group of people that uh, we, uh, they were interested in, particularly about Cyanothus and seed collection with Cyanothus. Uh, it can be tricky because the Cyanothus, you know, you want again to wait until it's it's ready and dry. But if you have a hot day when it's ready, you know, just before you it's ready, and I had that situation happen where I thought, you know, oh, the Cyanothus is ready in two days. We're going to go and 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 grab it. Um, we had a heat wave the day before and all those seed pods exploded and and this, the seed was on the ground. So we were on our hands and knees literally to pick up seeds from the ground. Uh, and then we did it that way and it worked. Uh, we were not able to grab as many seeds as we would have otherwise if we had been able to grab the, 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 the uh, fruit from the tree. But it's just, the you know, sometimes that's what happens. <laughs> right. That's all the questions in the chat. Did anybody have any other questions they want to? Yeah, feel free to unmute, unmute if themselves. you'd like to. Well, this was very useful. Oh, um, good. Great information for us. Um, we do use some native soil from uh, the Nature Center, but we run out of it. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And so we have to go get... Um, soil to use. You also have to be careful that you don't have certain pathogens in your soil if you're transplanting. That's correct. So that's yeah. another reason for that. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. wonderful. Lots of good information. I didn't see any could, cedar wax wings either. I oh. know. I am so so bummed about that. What is going on? Well, um, I did see the a... first year. The first year I have that happening in my yard where I don't see the cedar wax wings uh, eating my toy on pumps. Usually they're all over it. Um, and and I'm so I'm so saddened about it. Last year was weird with all the robins. You know, they were following the robins. And I'm wondering if they're still following the robins and the robins decided to not come through San Diego because they don't do that every year. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know what the story well, is. But... I did see a big group on Pyracantha. Oh, in yeah. A parking lot next to a very busy street. So there was mm. a narrow planting mm -hmm. and they were all over it with cars all around them uh yeah, yeah. i don't know they got drunk on pyracantha <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i don't know um but but that seems like a common issue um for a lot of birds not just the cedar wax wings mm -hmm. but a lot of the other birds like the thrushes and um you know other birds that eat a lot of the berries they just haven't been around this winter and mm -hmm. um or in much smaller numbers yeah so yeah. I know we've been seeing yeah. all the berry plants are just like, just bursting. This is a good time to harvest mm -hmm. them, I guess, and get the seeds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah actually, it might be even a little too late because uh, bugs uh, get to them at, mm. at that point, you know. So um, you can try, but that might be a little too late. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do want to take this opportunity, so I won't be remiss in reminding everyone that we do have two events coming up at Buena Vista Audubon. On um, Joni, do you have the dates? Uh, March thirtieth, I think is when is that our movie? And then we have a concert on in April, so please check our website for those. Those are two events at the Nature Center. Just wanted to remind everybody about that. Um, yeah, and this was very helpful. Lots oh, of good. great information, um, especially species specific. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, very Species, species specific information that I just can't get into in, into in uh, you know a forty five minute um, <laughs> talk like this. But um, yes, the the you know it, don't don't ever hesitate to email me if you have a, a question about how to propagate a plant or ID or anything like that. Right, I'm gonna try the rock thing on on a sunny slope, south facing slope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Patricia. We appreciate having you You're and welcome. this has been really, really useful. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I look forward Thanks. to uh, future presentations and, and we'll see everybody next month. All right. All Take right. care. Have Great. a good night. All right. Thank you. Take Many care. thanks. Thank Bye -bye. you.